chapter 14 and we're looking here in chapter 14 the to the six visions given in this text chapter 14 the seventh is actually chapter in chapter 15 and we'll probably hopefully get there tonight but we must remember that the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible are not inspired <laughs> They are simply added for reference purposes so you can find your way around and someone could say, go to this chapter and this verse. But God didn't inspire those chapter divisions or the verse numbers that we find. And so it comes to us and contextually the visions don't end in chapter 14. They go on into chapter 15 as well. So we'll be looking at those tonight. So we're going to look at the six visions of Revelation chapter 14. Well, Revelation chapter 14 begins a series here of six separate prophetic visions. And they're not chronologically, perhaps not even connected, uh, other than in the plan and program of God. But each vision provides extended information about things in visions elsewhere. Some of them have already been given. Some of them are from the Old Testament, but there are explanations or further details given. And the first vision we find in, of course, Revelation chapter 14, 1 through 5. And this is his 144,000 seed souls for the kingdom of, kingdom of eight. Now, I don't believe God uh, chooses who's going to be saved. God chooses a priesthood, a nation, God chooses things and people for his purposes. And some of those people get saved, some of them don't. But God's choosing of people that has nothing to do with salvation. Abraham was chosen to be the father of the nation of Israel when he wasn't saved. He did get saved later, but he would have been the father of Israel even had he not gotten saved. And that is true, of course, that reveals to that in Romans chapter 9, that the they're not all Israel or Israel, but they who are of the promise, and that is those who have a faith. Abraham became one of those people through faith, just, of course, as Joshua did. So we're going to read this text. We invite you, if you're able, to stand out of respect for God's word. Uh, if you're not, you're welcome to be seated. But I'm going to read the first five verses here this morning. He says, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. That's at the second coming in glory. So John is seeing Jesus on Mount Zion. And with him 144,000, these are the 144,000 that were sealed in chapter 6, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder, I was very loud, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four beasts, that's the four cherubim, and the elders, that's the 24, the 12 leaders of the tribes of Israel, and the 12 apostles. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Obviously, uh, there's no human being that would fit their criteria if they were not glorified. So these are glorified people who return uh, during the tribulation time to preach for Jesus Christ. And at the second coming of Christ, they are on Mount Moriah with the Lord Jesus Christ, all 144,000 of them. Father God, as we bow before you this morning again, we reminded, Lord, that your word is inspired by you. 
It is our job to exact its meaning and to explain that meaning to your people. We will do the best I can this morning by your spirit. I pray your forgiveness for any areas where I have failed and ask, Lord, for your spirit to give understanding as any you can. Pray for any of those hearing here this morning or listening online who are not saved and born again, that, Lord, you trick their heart about their need of being born again, and, Lord, seek out the answer and help that they need to get that done. We thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, the first vision here is in verses 1 through 5. It is parenthetical, otherwise it's a portion within another portion of Scripture intended to give us some additional teaching. And it's looking beyond the tribulation to after the second coming of Christ to the earth. Now, what happens with many people who do not understand um, a, the, how to interpret the book of Revelations is that they presume it's chronological. And not always is the book of Revelations chronological. Otherwise, we have parentheses within the book of Revelation that are not chronological. They are, are, are to explain certain things uh, within the whole of the book of Revelation or with prophecy in general. And if we try to force a chronology on those, then, of course, they get people all messed up. Sometimes... Uh, you know, I, I want to pull my hair out when I uh, get online and I listen to some of these young preachers who have, doesn't even seem to have any foundations in biblical interpretation, hermeneutics. But here they are preaching the Word of God, and uh, they just really mess things up badly and confuse people. <clears throat> so it's this first vision we see Christ on Mount Zion. Zion, Jerusalem. Zion, Mount Moriah. Okay, those are all synonymous. So he is on Mount Zion with the 144,000 representing the remnant of the restored nation of Israel that will be the foundation of the kingdom age. Otherwise, these are going to rule the nation of Israel in Israel and their glorified beings. These are the first fruits of Israel for the kingdom age. First fruits, God always takes the first fruits for himself. And that, of course, is the basis of tithing in the word of God as well. Now, the first fruits always belong to God. Always. Uh, most people understand this. This is the foundation of, of tithing. Tithing isn't um, is simply paying to God what is God's. God owns the first fruits. So the first tenth is what God has, the tithe is the tenth. God owns that. It's his. It's not ours to give. We haven't given a thing until we've paid our tithe. And uh, that's a concept that is totally foreign to people today because they think it's just something that's under the law. No, it's as ancient as time is. That is the first fruits belong to God. That is a concept of biblical truth from the beginning of time. So... That is to acknowledge the first principle of, of, of everything we do in this life is to acknowledge is that the first fruits belong to God. Uh, he is the benefactor of everything we have, everything we own uh, or don't own, uh, everything that is of this world. God is a benefactor of those things. And we acknowledge that he is a benefactor by giving the first fruits back to God. It is our way of acknowledging that before God. But God says the first fruits are his. So these individuals were first introduced to us in Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 through 8, just before the abomination of desolation. So it's right about the mid-trib time, uh, right after the opening of the sixth seal, and just before the release of the great wrath of God in the seven trumpet judgments, of Revelation 6, 17. So they are glorified Jews who have returned to earth for the last of the seven-year tribulation to preach Jesus as the Messiah of Israel. And they cannot be killed, and just as the other two prophets have come, they cannot be killed, and they will live throughout this period of time. 
Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 16, as we look at this doctrine of the first fruits. It says, In the feast of the harvest, the fruits, first fruits of thy labor, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. What's he saying? That belongs to God. Now, the nation of Israel is an agricultural nation. Some people say, well, God didn't ask the tithe of, of the money. Uh, he asked the tithe of the agriculture. Well, yeah, everything, that's the way it was. <laughs> but they had value and they had worth. And they, by the time of Christ, uh, people would sell their stock, bring the, pen, the money that came in from that, in fact, the first fruits often brought a higher price uh, than the others because it was by it was God's, and so people would give a higher price for that. And, uh, and of course, it would raise the revenue for the temple. Exodus chapter 34, verse 26. The first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's mouth. Now, the concept here is that everything that broke the womb, belonged to God. That was the first fruit. So the firstborn of every animal belonged to God. Every first fruit of, of every field belonged to God. And it was the acknowledgement by giving that to the Lord through, through the temple that they acknowledged that fact. Now, that was an ancient practice, even before the giving of the law. So these 144,000 Jews will be signed, sealed in heaven with the name of God in their foreheads, and protected by God throughout the tribulation period. Revelation 14, 1 through 5 gives assurance to this fact. Otherwise, they are there on Mount Zion with Jesus. The only reason they can be there is they've survived the tribulation now. We don't realize how big a miracle that is for anyone to survive. These can't be killed. It's not going to be true of most of the people who get saved during these last three and a half years. Most of them won't survive. Those in physical bodies won't survive. So exactly 144,000 are sealed and exactly 144,000 will, uh, will be with Jesus on Mount Zion at his second coming. So Zion represents a temple site of Solomon in Jerusalem known as Mount Moriah. And in Jerusalem, J Jeremiah 15, uh, 50, 50 verse 28 and 51 through, through uh, 51 verse 10 the temple and Zion are used synonymously originally Zion was the south east hill of Jerusalem and Zion refers to God's chosen place to dwell among his redeemed and so that is how God revealed himself when the presence of God was in the tabernacle. It was revealed by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. God wanted to know the children of Israel to know he was there and in a very physical way. Now later on that was not continued in the temple. But Psalm 9 verse 11 says, Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth where? In Zion. Now the ancient time of Zion and this Mount Moriah. We trace the history of this all back, and you have, you know, you have quite a Bible study all by itself, both in history and in the Word of God. This is more than likely the very place where Abraham was to go and offer Isaac. Very same place. This is the thrashing floor of Onan that David bought from Onan. Onan said, I'll give it to you. David said, No, I'll not. I'll not take something for free to give to God. I want to pay a good price for it. And he prayed a good price for it. And then he gave it to the Lord. And on that same site, that is where Solomon built the temple of God. And the Holy of Holies was right over that thrashing floor of Onan. You know what's there today? <laughs> the Muslim site of, uh, of course, in, in Israel. That is their... Um, uh, place is there, uh, right over that same place. And of course, God's going to rebuild it. Uh, I, I believe one of these days you're going to have one of these little freak little bombs just drop right on that place and it'll be gone. And, and uh, God will take care of that. So 
Hope, uh, I'd like to know which one of the Muslims who uh, send that rocket there what will happen to him when that finally hits there. But uh, um, that will happen one day. Look at Psalm verse uh, 11 of Psalm 132. It says, The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. He won't, he won't repent. Of the fruit of thy body will I set up thy throne. Otherwise, of your descendants, David, uh, is going to be the restoration of the nation of Israel. I will set up that throne. That's a promise of, of course, Messiah would be through the line of David. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I teach them, their children shall also set up on the throne for evermore. evermore. There's always one of the faithful through the remnant of David. That is, of course, what we looked at this morning in Chronicles, Second Chronicles in the young King Josiah, who was a descendant of David, a faithful young man. Verse 13, For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. Now, always in Israel's failure, Judah was a tribe that took care of Jerusalem and, of course, Zion. Uh, they were Judah and Benjamin in that area. And they were always the last to be unfaithful. In the northern tribes, uh, the children of Israel would go into paganism, and all the faithful priests that lived in those areas would then return to Jerusalem and live there. And the faithful remnant came back to uh, Zion. That, of course, is today what's called Zionism, political Zionism, is a return of faithful Jews back to the land of promise and to Jerusalem itself. But that is not the Zionism of the Bible. Don't confuse political Zionism with biblical Zionism. Now, we know that there has to be political Zionism to have a nation for the tribulation time. But the Zionism of, of the book of Revelation is when Jesus establishes his kingdom in the land of Israel. And that is different than uh, historical or political Zionism. So it says, For the Lord hath chosen Zion, he hath desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever, here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless the provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priest with salvation, her saints shall shout and loud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointing. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon him shall his crown glory. That, of course, is a Messiah. Now, God has retained this piece of real estate for all of his, for all of eternity. And it is intended to represent on earth what God has in heaven. In heaven, there is a heavenly Jerusalem. And all that is on earth patterns what is in heaven. Moses was given that direction and then patterned the things of the temple and the tabernacle after what God revealed to him about heaven. So those patterns were replicated. Now, in the new heaven and the new earth, that heavenly Jerusalem is going to descend out of that heaven and become part of this new heaven and this new earth. Now, this earth that we know today will be dissolved with fervent heat. It's going to be burned up. It will be part of that lake of fire, which, of course, will um, become the eternal state of separation from God. So this first vision reveals a time of celebration in heaven, Revelation 14, 2. And the Lamb of God was taken away, the sin of the world is on Mount Zion, and has inhabited his kingdom on earth. What does that mean to us? What God says he will do, God will do. What God promises, God keeps. And that is a great truth for every one of us. Otherwise, don't let the world cast doubt about the promises of God in the book of prophecies. What God says he will do, he will do. And that is a confirmation of Revelation chapter 14 too. God said he'll be that way, it will be that way. So in Revelation 14 3, the 143,000 what? Sing a new song of redemption. Unique to them. Now, we have the song of Moses, we have the song of the Lamb, but this song is unique to them. 
there it's for them. Now the throne of God is on earth with the four cherubim and the 24 elders surrounding it. What do I speculate this is? I speculate this is the song of completion. Now Moses speaks a song of redemption about the deliverance from Egyptian bondage. That is a song of completion. This too is a song of completion because now the Messiah has come. Revelation 14.4 reveals that all these 144,000 are men. They will be unmarried and they will be morally pure. Now remember, this is important. In the glorified beings are not sexless. They simply don't reproduce. There will still be men and women in glorified men's bodies and women's bodies. Otherwise, they're, they're still gender, but they won't reproduce. They will be as the angels. When God created the angels, he created an exact number, and they do not reproduce. So they, they don't take on human form and, and uh, uh, reproduce angel babies, angel human babies with... with uh, as some people teach in the book of Genesis, and that's why there were giants in the land. That's all a bunch of nonsense, and, and don't get involved in that craziness. But Because angels don't reproduce. That's as simple as it is. So they have no DNA that can be passed on and produce something that is half human, half angel. That's just not the way they were created. Angels don't reproduce, and when we're glorified, we won't reproduce anymore. Uh, we will have a perfect body. And the kingdom age, there will be reproduction of those who survive the tribulation. They go into the kingdom age in physical bodies like this one. They'll marry, be given in marriage, have children who have children who have children. And they'll probably live for a thousand years, that whole thousand year time. But these 144,000, they're all men. They're glorified. Um, you know, men and women won't be married in the glorified bodies. I told my wife we won't be married in the kingdom, but we can still live together. Right? Uh, uh, but, you know, if that's all right with the Lord, I'm sure he won't mind. Uh, I, I don't know why he would. Uh, unless he finally says, you've had enough of that guy. You, you don't have to live with him anymore. But uh, other than that, uh, you know, the old joke is my wife threatened to leave me, but I told her I was going with her. And, uh, she didn't go, but uh, uh, they, they will be unmarried. They'll be morally pure. Otherwise, um, sex won't be part of the glorified body. Now, follow here from a Greek word that means to become a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So that is what this is talking about, to follow the teaching and pattern of another. So they, they're going to follow the Lamb. They're going to be like and live and teach like Jesus taught. And these 144,000 will have dedicated themselves to serving the Lord just as Christ was a servant while he was on earth. And these are God's Old Testament Jewish first fruits harvested from the world for the kingdom age. And they will serve him in some capacity for the whole 1,000 year kingdom age. Probably as a royal priesthood from every tribe rather than just the tribe of Levi. Now we have the priesthood of the believer of the church age. They're going to have dominant rule over all the nations of the world. My speculation is these will rule in Israel. These 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. And they'll re rule over the nation of Israel uh, and do exactly as Jesus said to, for them to do. Now vision 2 comes in four, Revelation 14, 6 through 7. And this is the great commission for the kingdom age. Now, why do we need to have somebody preach the gospel of the kingdom age? Well, because there are going to be people who are going to go into the kingdom age. They'll be saved, but they'll have children who will have children. Now, I don't know whether or not the Bible says in that time there they shall be as trees. Otherwise, I believe the speculation is that they will have the life of a tree. I personally believe that the kingdom age will be restored back to a pre-flood kind of world. God has to, uh, at least geographically, uh, geologically and geographically, he's going to alter the world in great ways. The valley shall be brought, raised up. The mountains shall be brought low. 
and the most elevated place on earth will be the city of Jerusalem where Jesus reigns. And the rest will be uh, probably again on one continent. I believe that's the way it was before the flood. One continent separated of course by um, a body, a large body of water, but the, all, all inhabitants will be on one continent. That'll take place and a lot of other things. But people will more likely live for that whole 1,000 years. Before the flood, how long did they live? About 1,000 years. And that was normal for that for people. Be, then God reduced it to three score and ten. And uh, I've already pushed that one four years in the, in, 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 into uh, the debit on that side. So... Uh, so here in this, we see in verse 6, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Where is he? He's in the midst of heaven. Having the everlasting, now that word everlasting means perpetual, the same since the world began. The everlasting gospel. The gospel has never changed. It's always been exactly the same. You're saved by grace through faith in what God promised he would do. Now in the new covenant, you not only have to believe in what God promised he would do, you have to believe what he did. And that is reflected in the great words of Christ on the cross of Calvary, it is finished. And so we worship a, it, the Jesus in a completed work, uh, perpetual. But the gospels never change. There's always the promise of, the, of, of, a, of a God-man who would die for the sins of the world and to crush Satan's headship. So the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the water. Now, this is a, concept of these that are now to preach this message to the kingdom. So we have these 144,000. They're going to go into the kingdom age. They'll preach there. We have all glorified church age believers who will be the uh, Melchizedek and priesthood to rule over Israel. They'll preach the gospel of the kingdom. So I guess that means that all the people who get saved doesn't have to preach the gospel anymore, right? We have all these professionals Glorified people to do it. Now, that's not the way God works. But, in fact, it will not be, uh, it will not be the successes of the glorified who uh, will keep the gospel uh, and see people get saved. Remember that. It is always better that the people in the pew do the evangelizing rather than the pastor. I'd rather have people in our congregation who are won by people in our congregation rather than me win every single one of them to Christ. Because I'm not going to be here forever. But there's a continuum in the family of God. And that's the way the church ought to grow. Is when people in the pew are winning people to Christ and making disciples. And so my job is to equip you, to mature you, and the Bible's word for that is to perfect you for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Who does the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ? Well, it's the congregation. The saints, that's all believers. So the second vision details the deliverance now of the commission to preach the gospel message to those entering the kingdom age and committing into their care for preaching. It is their responsibility. Now this is like the commission to preach the gospel given to the saints of the church age in Matthew chapter 28. And since people were born during the kingdom age, there will be a people who will need to bear the gospel and be saved. And just like the God gave the apostles to keep the gospel pure of works, now he's going to have 144,000 Jews in the nation of Israel to keep the gospel pure and, of course, he's going to have church-age saints who will rule as kings and priests with Jesus. Look at Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Do we have a command to do this? Now, remember, we have a change of dispensations. We're in the church age. We have a command as believer priests in the church age, just as they will have a command 
in the kingdom age to preserve the gospel during that time because it is constantly being corrupted. So Jude one three it says, Beloved, when I give all, when I when I gave all diligence, this was of utmost importance to write unto you of the common salvation. Otherwise, it's the same for everyone. Some people don't get saved differently than you get saved. Everybody gets saved exactly the same. You have a different testimony from where you've come, but it's exactly the same. Repent, believe, confess, call, and receive. It's exactly the same for everyone. That's common salvation. But he says it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you. Why? Why do they need to be exhorted? Because we have a tendency to become complacent. We forget our priorities. We become complacent compromisers. Just as Paul and, and Barnabas did at Galatia. It wasn't that they preached the, that salvation by works. They tolerated it. We should be absolutely intolerant of anything other than the common salvation. He says, it was needful for me to write and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. How come we have so many faiths today when there's only one? Because people haven't contended. Now, if, you know, if we just practice that simple principle when we see people teaching something false, we say, stop that. Knock that off. That's not right. We won't put up with that. They wouldn't take 20, 30 people with them and go start another sect of uh, some corruption that they call Christianity and it's not. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, what's the commandment here? Church age, yes. All things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, what? The same Commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. Now, we have to have this going on. If we're going to continue to have generation after generation of Christians, we can't even get Christians to come to church anymore. They come at their convenience. They're not committed to the church. They may love the church. They may attend it faithfully. But they're not committed to building, edifying, building up the body of Christ. They're not committed to that. You know, we, we do all kinds of reasons, uh, things for all kinds of reasons, but no matter what we do, the person of Christ has to be at the top of our list, and building his church ought to be second. You say, well, that's not my priority. Well, then get your, get your priorities right. It's that simple. 1 Corinthians 15, what's the gospel? Now, I want to say right here, I don't know of any form or derivative of Christianity that doesn't believe the gospel. The problem is they don't know what to do with it. They have different responses to the gospel other than repent, believe, confess, call, and receive. They've got other responses to the gospel. Repent, believe, get baptized, join the church, um, you know, do good works, on and on and on and on. Or they, do, they, they subtract to it. Uh, believe in Jesus, whoever he is. You can believe in the historical Jesus. You don't have to believe in the Jesus of the Bible. So you don't have to study the Bible to find out the Jesus of the Bible. You don't have to, you can believe without understanding God has wrath has been satisfied. You can believe without understanding that justification is a gift of God's kind righteousness, not the achieving of God's kind righteousness. And you can confess Jesus without Confessing that he is God incarnate in human flesh. All of this is nonsense today. So we have reduction, we have uh, adduction, we have people who have add things to it, and that is for what we're to contend. But here Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also you are saved, if 
You keep in memory what I have preached unto you unless you have believed in vain. Now that's a problem. Not that they could lose it, but their faith was in vain. It was empty. Of what? Understanding. That's the principle of Matthew 13 and the parables of the stores and the soils. The one who brought forth much fruit of he who heard with what? Understanding. We have such shallow presentation of what the gospel accomplishes and what we're supposed to do with it. We have all kinds of people who profess Christ, but they don't. he doesn't possess them. So he says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. You have to understand that and believe it, what it means to be saved. We have a lot of people who say, Well, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. But they don't understand what it accomplished. And that he was buried. You had to be buried. He buried dead people. And that he rose again the third day. Otherwise he died for our sins and was buried as proof. But he was victorious. He rose again. And because he has risen, we shall rise. According to what? The scriptures. There will be believers from all nations who will survive the tribulation judgment brought to saving faith in Jesus Christ with the preaching of the 144,000. Other circumstances that will be there, I believe those people will win other people to Christ before they are killed. There may be many who trust in Christ and prior to the pouring out of the last seven vials of God's wrath or even during that time. The difficulty here is how they might survive the last three and a half years without being able to earn a living, buy and sell, yet they must have refused the mark of the beast somehow. By whatever means this will be accomplished, uh, of course, Zechariah 14, 16 through 21 tells us there will be those of all nations who will survive the tribulation. And since all these, those with the mark, will be consumed at the second coming of Jesus Christ by the very glory of God, these survivors must be believers. Zechariah 14, 12. I'm going to close up with these portions of scripture from Zechariah. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. This is during the tribulation time. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. I get a picture of somebody standing right here and just watching the flesh melt from their bodies. Just literally, like wax figures, the flesh just melts from their body. I wish I could do that for you, but you know, I you, know, you have to have some imagination. But huh. I'd be willing to do that if you if you believe it, maybe bring some fear of God uh, to us. But their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, literally melt. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it's just going to melt and become liquid on the ground. Look at Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass. What's that mean? What God says will happen, will happen. That everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, that's all the nations, they don't have to be there. It is just that they're part of one of those nations, wherever they are in the world, that came against Jerusalem, shall go, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of the tabernacles. These are people from all nations who get saved. Otherwise, they would not have survived the, not survived the tribulation. They have to get saved. The second coming of Christ, they would not survive. Verse 17. And it shall be that whosoever will come up will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king. The Lord of hosts, even upon them, shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, that have no rain, that have no rain, there shall be the plague. Otherwise, first, no rain. Second, then there'll be plague. Wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacle. This is kingdom age. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. 
So if you're a believer and you say, I'm not traveling all the way up there to do that, God says, okay, no rain. And then if that doesn't correct the problem, then there'll be no, uh, there'll be plague. So God is going to reinstitute the pure worship of him according to his dictates. So this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the feast of the tabernacles. In that day shall there be upon the bells of the whole horses holiness unto the Lord. That is a reminder that God is holy. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yet every pot in Jerusalem and Jeru Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them. Now this word holy literally means sanctified. These are just for God's use. Shall, shall come and take of them and seed therein, in these bowls or pots. And that day there shall, come, there, there, there shall be no more Canaanite in the house of the Lord. Otherwise, only believers will come. And there's going to be some very exacting specifications regarding their worship. God just not, does not just restore and preserve his words. God restores and preserves pure worship. And pure worship, the first thing we ought to think about when we walk in the doors of the church to worship God, is have I sanctified myself before God today? Have I done what 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says? Have I confessed my sins? He is faithful and just to forgive my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness and therefore restore fellowship with God. The great problem today is we have unholy people who do not live sanctified lives who want to come into the church and worship God in their sin without repenting of it. They don't want you to talk about their sin. They don't want to make you, they don't want you to make them feel guilty uh, because that is judging them. I'm not judging you, I'm informing you. What you do with it is your business. But remember this God will not accept the worship of those who do not come before Him with the intent of being sanctified. That is a forsaking of your sin, confessing it, and seeking to live with all your heart, soul, and might to the glory of God. That's who, that's who can worship God. The Bible says very clearly that Jesus talked to the Samaritan woman who thought she could worship God any way she wanted to. And Jesus says, if you're going to worship God, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's the only way. You can't worship him in your lies and your sins and think it's okay with God. God's not okay with that. Now, I say that not because I hate you, but because I love you. If you want that, if you really want to truly worship God, you better get your heart into it. And if you want to worship God with all your soul, you're going to have to get your soul saved because if you can't have a saved soul, God won't accept your worship. Repent. Understand that God's wrath has been satisfied in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and every sin you have ever committed. God has remitted the penalty of that sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. Believe and understand that God wants to gift you His righteousness in the gift of His indwelling Spirit when you call upon the name of the Lord. But before you call, you must call upon the one you have confessed and His name is Jesus and He is Jehovah God incarnate in human flesh. And the Bible says you must confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and then thou shalt be saved. And then you must call upon his name. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But don't call if you haven't repented. Don't call if you have not believed that God is wrath has been satisfied. Don't call unless you believe God is going to gift you his righteousness and your salvation not depend upon yours. Don't call unless you're willing to confess Jesus Christ is your Lord and sovereign. And then you can call. And when you call, then you will receive the Lord Jesus Christ in the person of his indwelling spirit. And then and only then will you be born again. I'm just telling you the truth. The world has corrupted that simple message over and over again, continues to corrupt it today. And our job is to restore it. 
That's what Paul does after all of the preaching of the book of Romans. In chapter 10, he restores the simplicity of what do you need to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Because you must be born again. If you're here today and not sure if you're saved, today's a good day to get saved. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. Not next week. If you have understood today, today is the day to get saved. Don't put it off and say, well, let me think about that. If you understand it, get saved today. Our Father God, as we bow before you this morning, we are so thankful for the clarity of your word. And Lord, line upon line, precept upon precept, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, you're constantly restoring and reassuring us of what you have said and what is your will. We glorify you for that and your long-suffering and patience with us.